Okay, so welcome to the practice-based learning webinar series. It's a series of six webinars. So this is our second webinar. Um, so my name is Kalima Ibrahim. I'm Chair of Council, Council Member of England and Chair of the RCOT England Board and also a, uni a lecturer at University of East London. And so please say hello in the chat. Let us, let us know who's joining today where you're from and what, what role you have in practice-based learning. Okay, we're RCOT, so we champion occupational therapy. We're here to achieve life-changing breakthroughs for our members, for the people they support and society as a whole. We promote the value of occupation in improving people's health and well-being. We promote the value of occupational therapy as a means of improving people's health and well-being. We have a vision that people everywhere value life-changing power, the life-changing power of occupational therapy. So our profession is growing. We have over 45 education providers in the UK delivering over 100 programmes with over 7,000 learners and over 1,700 new graduates. So increasingly diverse cohorts experiencing a range of practice-based learning opportunities across the four pillars of practice. So we need to think differently about our placement opportunities to meet the needs of our learners, our services and the people that we serve. So these are the principles of practice-based learning. So we developed a set of seven guiding principles to support the development of quality sustainable placement opportunities for pre-registration learners and was launched on the 20th of October 2022 in collaboration with the CSP and they are available to download on the RCOT website and there should be a link in the chat that will take you there. Okay so our first webinar uh, so our first presentation, second webinar today, sorry, is called Innovation in Placement Creation. So it's practice-based learning as a CPD opportunity. So our session plan will have three presentations and at the end we'll have a Q&A. So all, all the present presenters will go first and then afterwards we'll have Q&A and you can direct your questions directly to each, uh, each pre presenter at the end. So this webinar is relevant to two, four and five of the practice-based learning principles and also the learning and development standards for pre-registration education, domain five, and also the career development framework. Okay, so throughout the chat, if you'd like to put your questions and comments and thoughts in the chat, and also on, on social, social media, hashtag RCOTPBL, and these are the Twitter handles at the bottom of the slide. And just throughout the presentation, you can also just comment and put some, some um, questions in the chat, and we'll get to those afterwards. Okay, so our first presenter is um, El Elma McVoy, the Ocean Occupational Therapy Practice Educator, Practice Education Coordinator at Southern Health and Social Care Trust, and it's titled "A Team-Based Approach to Practice-Based Learning Whilst Providing CPD Opportunities." Right. Sorry, my name is Elma, and I'm the Occupational Therapy Practice Education Coordinator for the Southern Health and Social Care Trust. Um, the post was originally funded October uh, 2021 by a grant from the Department of Health for a six months project with the hope that recurrent funding would be fine um, for it to continue. But unfortunately, that didn't happen. But I am in the lucky position that um, I continue to be funded on a month to month basis at the minute. Uh, so long may it continue. Um, I work within the Southern Health and Social Care Trust, one of five trusts within Northern Ireland. We're the red one at the bottom of the screen there. And we primarily take students from Ulster University, um, which the campus recently moved from Belfast up to McGee, which is up in the northwest there. 65 students in year one this year. And each trust has a different quota of students, depending on staffing. So we would have usually 11 to 13 students out on each block of placement. Um, and just to give you some background, there are approximately 300 occupational therapy staff within the trust working in a variety of areas, um, children's mental health, disability services, etc. We have two acute hospitals, two non-acute hospitals, a range of inpatient and outpatient services, community rehabilitation, community occupational therapists, range of services, and students can have placements throughout them, um, which I then coordinate and organise. Um, the previously, 
or before this post was in place, the student placements were organised by one of the team lead OTs, who did a wonderful job as well as her clinical role and her managerial role. So when this post came along, it was an opportunity to develop that role, to look at it careers advice for potential students and to develop the workforce, to develop the clinical education within the trust and to also to support newly qualified occupational therapists. Um, so the project started and we looked at different projects that we could um, do within the six months or the proposed six months. And one of the things I started to do was a generic induction information or generic induction portfolio for students coming to placement throughout all these different areas within the trust. Um, to date, each department had been making their own induction information. So I had the opportunity to think, OK, we need we can all do with an generic, generic induction booklet and put that together. And together with that, I also wanted to encourage team based placements. Um, Staffing has been difficult. The last couple of years have been very difficult and we need to continue to provide quality placements for the students. So those were my two main projects to start with. And as we worked through those, we realised there was a lot more benefits becoming evident in terms of benefits for clinical education, for teamwork and for CPD opportunities for everybody. So there was a need for a generic induction portfolio. There's a great variation of information given out and available. We have a lot of teams there. Everybody was really under pressure. There was the pace of change and a great time of uncertainty for everybody. Um, we had anxiety of students and staff during the pandemics, during the pandemic, both professionally and personally. And there was further segregation of teams. Um, some services had been stepped down. Some staff had been redeployed. Um, some teams lost their OT departments for other purposes and still haven't got them back. So there was a lot going on and decreased social interaction and integration between staff and with the students moving to um, virtual learning. Um, great workload pressures and priorities. And um, there's a piece at the bottom you maybe can't see, sorry, but. Um, oops. Sorry, we're going backwards. Um, there was also email and virtual information overload. I know you would get a policy or guidelines one day. Two days later, it's been reviewed, sent out again, and people just switched off. I think we went virtual, but it was virtual overload at times. And in the midst of all that, there was also a need to provide um, quality placements for the students. So with information overload and lots of information, the idea was to try and keep everything together um, so that we could give it out to the students and help the staff too. The aim of the project was to ensure consistent and correct information was given out, to centralise essential and mandatory information so it's all easily accessible in one place and hopefully to minimise the risk and increase safety of students and staff and the patients as well. Avoid duplication. We had lots of really hard working teams all working away in their own area, but a lot of them were introducing the same types of information. So it was to avoid the duplication and put it all together. And also aim to save clinical time, um, both in terms for practice educators and for students, um, just to give that bit more time for staff and to assist and encourage practice educators and practice learning, and also to make the students feel welcome and supported. So the portfolio was put together and like all good projects, it ends up a lot bigger um, than you originally anticipated. But we got a, a portfolio put together and it includes um, generic information for all students, irrespective of where they're going in placement throughout the trust. So we have trust information, we have occupational therapy services information, such as the various teams, what our rotations are for each area, the type of contracts um, staff might have, what to expect on practice education placement. Um, we do expect them to ask questions. 
they will get feedback. We expect them to give feedback, just outlining um, what to be expected on placement. Pre-placement requirements such as uniform, lunches, um, any support needs that they may have, we're encouraging them to let us know about that. Uh, do they have access to a car? Will they be using a car on placements? Health and safety turned out to be a massive section with lots of vital information, including infection control, waste, what to do in terms of illness, um, fire. These sort are of things that are relevant to each department. Um, now, having done all this, each department do add their own bits to it. They will add their own specific information to it, but the general information is included that will be for everybody. Um, professional issues, including confidentiality, consent, um, use of mobile phones, and then placement specific information, uh, their supervision, their objectives, whether they'll be presenting a case study. Um, and also then we put comments through it to give support to the students, to make it user friendly and to make us appear much more welcoming. And one I particularly like is all experts were once beginners. Um, so we, we were all there. We've all been there. We all had to learn at one time. So we trialled it when we put it together um, with the students that were there on placement at the time and with staff. And we sent it out to lots of various teams, to staff of all grades, so they could all look at it, check the information, check its relevance. Um, and then once it was compiled, it's sent out electronically to students before they come on placement. So the outcomes from it, we have got consistent and correct information all in one place. Our um, only thing that we do need to work on is to continue to monitor it and update it as relevant. And while I'm still in post, I'm doing that at the minute. Um, the essential and mandatory information is now readily available in one area. Staff have commented that it's made trust policies feel relevant. I know I was on placements many years ago, but I still remember them all. And I know the worst thing I, the one thing I disliked about placement was arriving and being handed this lever arch file with about six inches of policies and procedures and um, things to read, which really made very dry work. Um, but this, because we have highlighted sections and we've put in the um, we have um, put in the electronic links to any e-learning that they have to do before they come on placement. So it's in bite-sized pieces. They can pick it up, put it down again as they go, rather than having to come on placement and spend the first couple of days working through policies and procedures. And there's been positive feedback from staff and students. And it has been easily adapted to include departmental specific information for teams. And it has also saved clinical time with the induction information sent out. Plus on day one, um, when the students do come in placement, they go to their various areas in the morning, meet the team, see the area. And then with the increased use in virtual um, medias, we've been using Zoom and Teams as well for in the afternoon of the first day when they come on placement, I would get all the students together in that block and I go through a welcome and an induction with them um, and an introduction as well. I introduce myself, they introduce each other, um, talk about the areas that they're going on placement, where they've been before, specific interests, things like that. Give an overview of the portfolio, just checking out their um, relevant information and looking at um, what they want to do for the placement and what their aims for the placement are. And that gives the practice educators time to get their heads together and to see what, you know, gives them more time to themselves in the afternoons. Um, we also have been looking at how we can use that to see, um, to get the students all together for different tutorials and things. And my counterpart in the Belfast Trust has a very good article in October's OT News about some of the work that she's been doing as well. So. Moving on the thing, moving along. And if I press it twice, it's probably going to move. Sorry, there we go. Um, so together with that, we've also been encouraging a team-based approach to um, practice education. Where 
The placement is seen that it's with a team rather than one specific practice educator. Now, we still do have a named practice educator who has ultimate responsibility for completing the report forms and for the placement. But it's trying to encourage all members of the team to be involved, to share the workload and to utilise the individual skills of the team. There's continuity with unplanned staff absences. I know we've had lots of those recently, and it's very difficult to know what uh, members of staff are going to be in any particular day. So you're not relying on one person. The team knows what's happening. The team know that the student's coming, what the student's objectives are. And the student themselves feels part of the team much quicker. There's a more consistent approach to objectives and goals. Um, again, with not relying on a practice educator, um, things can be shared out a bit more with the team. There's increased availability of informal supervision and support for the student and for the staff. And again, it increases availability of clinical time if you can share the workload. So we worked on both of these. We got the um, portfolio together and we um, worked on team based placements. And what we noticed as we went along with that, there was more benefits coming through. It encouraged a team based approach to placement and a lot of people were very keen to be involved when the whole team was involved. The um, portfolio I had sent out regularly for feedback from teams. So it started conversations within teams. I didn't know that. I didn't know that. Oh, so the student needs to know this. So I need to know it as well. And teams were getting more involved. Um, and it increased staff involvement with practice education. Many of the staff, I don't know if everybody else has heard comments like, oh, well, I only work part time. I couldn't look after a student or the band sevens do that. Um, so it encouraged all grades of staff to be involved. And it improved team working. The teams were starting to have conversations around practice education, looking at these as their colleagues of the future. Um, and that they were going to be part of the team in the future. So there was definite team working and everybody involved and increased interest in practice based learning as well. We also got additional offers of placement opportunities. Staff who didn't have the, um, the confidence maybe to be a full practice educator felt, well, I can contribute to this. I could help if I've got the support of the rest of the team. So we did have a few additional offers and additional consideration of placement models. People were thinking of split placements, of shared placements, um, and if, if things were shared, they should work out that bit better for everybody involved. And there were also CPD opportunities as well came out through it. Um, for myself, there was a lot of new learning. I thought I've been about a long time and I thought I knew most of the things that were there. But when you start to deal uh, to delve into the policies and the procedures. There's a lot of new learning out. One of the things that stood out for me was um, on data protection and records retention that um, we were able to add in a section for the students as to how we kept their information that it's stored securely for 10 years after placement and then disposed of confidentiality or confidentially. And that's something I never knew before. So there was lots of drawers and filing cabinets got cleared out after 10 years. I was updating my knowledge and skills, policies, procedures, teams. I was networking throughout different teams, um, looking at how relevant um, information was for them, what their needs were, what their roles were. Um, a lot of teams we don't meet um, on a regular basis. And my new phrase is, you don't know what you don't know. You think you know things, but it's only when you really get face to face with people and start to find out what their role is and what they need. While they're all occupational therapists, the role varies so much. So I learned a lot through that as well. Some negotiating. Some people had done things in a particular way for a long time and felt that it worked. Um, and then it's trying to bring in a new way of working for people and seeing how best you can approach their team and show how it's going to benefit their team in the long run. A lot of feedback from teams, from staff, from students, um, presenting to a lot of teams as well. I was coaching some of the staff um, to look at how they can get involved in practice education and how they can bring their skills to it. Um, reflecting and updating and changing and getting feedback. 
um, educating others and encouraging others as well to be involved. And for the other staff, there was also um, continued professional development opportunities, new learning. Um, there was a lot of information in the portfolio that a lot of staff weren't aware of. Most people um, do, you know what happens in your area, but you don't know what happens in everybody else's. And with all the information overload and things, it was very difficult to keep up to date with what was happening. So what we were saying to teams was, well, this is what the students going to know. So you really should know it as well. So they can come to you, they can ask questions, they can ask any member of the team anything about it. And staff were really interested because it was all put together in a very neat, user-friendly way. And they were updating their knowledge and their skills. They were delegating in that they, you know, some practice educators had to consider, well, what can I delegate to the rest of the team? Um, I know you have two types of people you can come across, those who say, well, that's not my responsibility. You'd need to speak to the practice educator or practice educators who don't want to delegate things out, who sort of feel, well, if I ask somebody else to do it, it mightn't be done right. So it was working through that with teams and starting conversations as to what can you delegate to other people and what can you offer to do to help um, with practice education. Reflecting on what they've done to date, what they could do, looking at new approaches, um, how students could be accommodated within their areas. Uh, training, increasing confidence for a lot of the staff. They suddenly thought, well, if there's support here, I could maybe get more involved in this and do with it. Adapting ways of working, presenting and demonstrating. We've had some very good examples of an increased use of support staff or occupational therapy assistants and technical instructors doing the induction for students. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be the practice educator who shows the student around the department, who introduces them to everybody else, who shows them where the stationery is kept. Um, we've also had some support staff who have been doing their um, regional qualifications framework or regulations qualifications framework, and they have been able to sign off some of the competencies by demonstrating equipment to the students, um, demonstrating techniques that are used in the department to the students as well, and explaining an increased involvement in um, practice education activities that they have never been involved with before. And people have been given support to each other and encouragement to write the thing. And what we did as a starting off by developing an induction portfolio and looking at how we could um, increase teamwork to look at the, you know, securing the workforce of the future, we really found out that there was a lot of benefits came with it and the outcomes for practice education. We did encourage new practice educators and new practice based learning opportunities. There's an increased ethos of team placements and team responsibility rather than heavy reliance on one practice educator. Staff have um, commented on increased job satisfaction and enthusiasm for practice education. It's not seen that somebody else does. Um, it's seen as part of the team and everybody has their role within that. And should that be purely um, updating telephone numbers on the induction information to actually carry out large chunks of um, the training within it. It's been working well together. There's new placement models considered and it's encouraged involvement of all staff. And it has added to the quality and the effectiveness in placement. And as we know, students are more likely to return as colleagues if they feel welcome and supported. And hopefully these initiatives have done that for them. So thank you. Thanks for that, Elma. So next we have our second presentation, which is uh, by Claire Headley. The slides are going to move. Could you move the slides, Claire? Have you, have you got access? I'm just working on it. Can you do that? Yeah, that's fine. That's fine. <laughs> Um, and if you just put your answers and comments or any questions and comments in the Q&A box, then we can get to those at the end as well. So any questions for Alma, um, we'll get to those at the end. Actually, there's one already. Yeah, just keep putting your questions in the chat. So 
claim my apologies here. I've taken remote control, but I can't get my the screen won't move. Oh, there we go. <laughs> it's moving now. <laughs> I, find, uh, I find the first couple were very slow to move and then it worked yeah. after that. Okay, so just introducing okay. our second presenter, which is Claire Headley. She's an OT practice education lead at NHS England and NHS Education Scotland, and it's titled Practice Based Learning as a CPD Opportunity, Long Arm Supervision. So over to you, Claire. Thanks very much, Kalima. So first of all, just to wish everyone happy OT week, because um, we're obviously in OT week this week, so it's a good way to kick it off. Um, so a bit about myself, um, I'm obviously, my name's Claire Headley. I am seconded as to NHS Education Scotland um, based in Glasgow, and I'm currently the Uni Professional Occupational Therapy Practice Education lead covering the whole of Scotland. Um, we have been brought into post by the Scottish Government, um, provided by uh, funding there to look at recovering, remobilising, um, modernising and making practice education sustainable across Scotland. And we have to do that in 18 months. So a slightly um, large remit in a very small time. So that's my wee title there, so we'll move past that. So I'm going to have a wee chat to you today about long arm supervision. Um, and I have now, since coming into this post, have carried out two um, supervisor roles with long arm supervision. Um, also, the same projects were peer assisted learning, project based, role emerging, and um, placement. So, I am very much a go big or go home, which can sometimes be to my detriment. So, you can see here that the definition provided by NHS Education for Scotland about long arm supervision um, basically, exactly what it says is that the supervisor is located at a distance to the practice learning area and takes responsibility for supervising and supporting the student. And they also confirm, verify the outcomes. I want to put a bit of a disclaimer on this because obviously long arm supervision is not new. The universities have been using it for many, many years. I think it has perhaps been um, sort of reinvigorated um, with and, and got increased interest to address the placement capacity issue that we are facing as a profession. And what we found in the project that I've been involved in is that there are third sectors that will bite your hand off to provide uh, OT placement. However, there aren't those supervised. So we're having to look for um, long arm supervisors. So I am a huge fan of Simon Sinek and in particular his Golden Circle. For those of you that don't know Simon Sinek, he has written a lovely book of Start With Why. Um, and I've used this in a lot of my projects. So what they're saying is a lot of organizations will start with what, and we'll move into the inner circle. And what I would suggest you do is that we always start with why and ask why could we deliver um, long arm supervision to increase placement capacity and as a valuable CPD tube tool. And after establishing your why, we can then visit how we deliver it, and then what do we deliver? What is the outcome of it? And as I say, I've used this model to structure my presentation with you guys today as well. So why should we do long arm supervision as occupational therapists? When I did my two um, projects, um, which I'll come on to later, I found I was absolutely terrified of doing long arm supervision. How could I possibly assess someone at a distance when I maybe wasn't meeting them? I wasn't with them all the time. How, how could I know what I was what I was going to do? So I visited the why of that. And the why of doing long arm supervision for me was that it improved my self-confidence. And you can see these on the screen, improved my interpersonal skills and um, improved professional independence, improved my professional identity, looked at opportunities for clinical reasoning, very much improved collaboration because you're linking in with um, members of staff who aren't necessarily non -E aren't necessarily sorry, AHPs in the third sector. The long arm supervision process um, is very much a future utilization of occupational therapy services. Where else can we offer OT? It did very much increase capacity. Um, at one point I was supervising five students um, to one placement. And I think perhaps the most important point for me is creating placements in many non-traditional areas. Now, I am a real 
stickler. I don't like the words non-traditional or traditional. I would rather we just call placements. But for example, we have created um, a placement with a paddleboard organisation. There's conversations going on about having a um, placement with a scout, the scouting organisation. And there's also been um, placements created with homeless charities, which are all long arm supervision um, placements. So next I looked at how I was going to do it. And initially I thought, right, I will do all my supervision, all my communication virtually. I was in a lucky position that the, the two placements I was long arm supervising were maybe about half an hour from myself. So I did eventually move to a hybrid model because what I found is a lot of the students that I was supervising didn't necessarily understand what long arm was. And I think there's a little bit of work to be done there to explain to students what it actually is. And what did we involve? involved being provided by an experienced practice educator who is not based in the same organisation. Um, on site, the students are usually supervised by a senior member of staff within the host organisation, and they are supported by an HCPC registered OT. And the practice education is normally based in healthcare, higher education, local authority or third sector. But really, for long arm supervision, you could base the students wherever they felt there was to be a, a need for an occupational therapist or a project to be explored. So my experiences, one of my experiences was with a paddleboard company called Central Scotland Adventures. Um, this was a long arm supervision one that I took on that was hybrid. So in meaning in hybrid, I did some of it face to face and some of it um, virtually. It was also peer assisted with five students in different year groups that I took. And it was also project based to identify the social, emotional and well-being benefits of paddleboarding as a meaningful and purposeful occupation. The other one that I took on was again a long arm, oops, sorry. It was again a long arm supervision hybrid model, which was role emerging within Braid Health and Wellbeing Centre. And that was four students in the same YAR group. I think that's meant to say year group. And it was again project based and um, using gardening as a meaningful occupation. Both of these didn't have um, OTs on site. And um, so that was why we were doing long arm supervision. So the challenges that I faced on this, and this is where I think the CPD came in for me in its own evidence of learning. I really struggled to think, right, how can I gather the evidence of learning? I had four or five students on placement. I was getting inundated with emails and I wasn't sure how to do it. So Google Drive then suddenly became my best friend and it absolutely saved an overloaded inbox and also helped me keep up to date with our students. I would say in a long arm supervision, we really need to be creative in the type of evidence that we're collecting. So reflections, blogs, vlogs, mind maps, whatever works for your students, you would use them. I found that communication could be challenging um, although I think that was on my side as practice educator rather than the student side, we did create an MS Teams page, which we initially used as a check in, check out. And then we started um, using it to do, um, so it was like self-care September. So they had to tell me something positive that they'd done that day um, or then give me a couple of insights for the day, which really helped me see what they were learning every single day. There was apprehension from both myself and the students, partly because it was a brand new paddleboard placement. We were looking at the value of occupation and also because we were doing the long arm supervision. And what I would say is that having that information sort of gathering before and having the open and honest conversation and actually saying to your student, this is new to me, let's learn together, I think was really, really valuable. There can again be a bit of a misunderstanding from the host services if they've not had um, OTs in po post and the OT students are going in. And again, I think this is very much about a conversation prior to placements and explaining your student role to them and asking students to present their role to the host, which again helps them meet one of the pillars of practice and looking at leadership. I wanted to share this with you. This was one of the reflections that one of my students did. Um, and I've only had two students make me cry. This is complete honesty. Two students make me cry on a placement, both for good reasons. And this student made me cry because I was so overwhelmed by what she was saying. So the reflection you can see on the left hand side of your screen, which is a tree, is actually quite sim similar to the Kawa model. And she explained this to us that the roots were where she'd come from. The tree was it growing. And then the leaves were where she felt she was now at and what she was going to be. And the river down the side was what had nurtured and helped her grow. And this was shared via long arm supervision 
And actually, she felt it was a really safe space to share this. And the other one was this picture um, on the right hand side of your screen that she did to share her reflections. And she said the most key point of that was the swan. And as we all know, swans are very graceful on top of the water. But she said her feet underneath the water were going 90 to the dozen. Um, and it helped open up the honest um open and honest conversations that we could have about what was worrying her. And this was all via long arm supervision as well. So gaining the same momentum flavor for what you would get if you were face to face. Some more student, um, sorry, more challenges busted was certain students have to be selected to do this type of placement. To a degree, yes. What you are asking is that students are flexible, they're open to new ways of learning and they're creative. And I say my experience of the students that I had is that they are a new sort of group of students coming out and they are very flexible to ways of learning and they are open to new. You may need to give some additional support. I think the misconception can be that as a long arm supervisor, you only have to meet with them one, at one time a week. That's not true. You still need to give them support and you still need to be available for that. The absolute apprehension with a lack of access to role models. And I really questioned this as well with people that have said this to me and I've said, I'm not creating a mini me. I'm creating OT students for the future workforce that have got transferable skills. And what better place to do that in a third sector, such as paddle boarding, where they are really trying to establish what the OT process is. What I did find very challenging is the supervision for more than one student. I, in reflection, foolishly gave them one hour a week um, so five students, five hours, which took up so much time. And I think going forward, I would consider a hybrid supervision model, sometimes giving them one to one, sometimes giving them group supervision and seeing how that worked and try that out. Other factors that I would say that you consider if you're using this as a CPD opportunity and considering long arm supervision is combine it with another type of project. So for example, your peer assisted learning or your project based, the feedback we've had for long arm is that it was great to have another student there to support that learning and they could bounce up ideas. It can be a little bit harder to build relationships. You often miss out on the informal chat. And actually I felt that in my first placement that I supervised, but in the second one, I ended up just calling people in and we had a cup of tea and um, it was a tea Tuesday that we had and we all had to meet for 15 20 minutes just checking in having a cup of tea and seeing how you were doing the role clarity can be quite difficult not so much from the long arm supervision point of view but if the students are on a role emerging placement that can be a little bit difficult and again the lack of understanding of ot which i'm sure we've all faced the learning outcomes as well what we often get um, for long arm is how do i know the learning outcomes are being met i'm not there i can't see them i'm not observing them doing this this or this and that's where, as I was saying, your reflections come in. The um, best piece of work that we had that reflected the learning outcomes was one of our students doing a blog and they got that published. And that was just amazing um, to see how they were, were doing and all their learning came through in that. So what I would say for a long arm supervision is a lovely quote that I quite like from Martin Luther King. And it says, you don't have to see the stair whole staircase. You just have to take the first step. I felt long arm supervision is a brilliant CPD opportunity for me. It's made me really think how I deliver OT, how OT can be delivered and actually almost reignited my passion for being with students and offering that support in a different way. So going back to Simon Sinek's point of saying that you have to ask why you're doing a project, my advice to you in terms of long arm supervision would be don't ask why you're doing long arm supervision, but actually ask why not. And there's my details there. Thanks very much. Hi, thanks for that, Claire. So if any questions or comments for Claire and Elma, if you'd just like to put them in the chat, sorry, in the Q&A section, in the Q&A box, and then we'll get to get to questions after our last present presentation. So our third presenter for the evening is Carolyn Hay. So she's a pre-registration education manager at RCOT, and her title of her presentation is called Pre-Registration Education, a CPD Opportunity for You. Okay, go ahead, Carolyn. Thanks, Kalima. So hi everyone, yes, happy OT week as well. Um, I work at RCOT in the role of pre-reg education manager. So all things pre-registration, um, pre-reg education sit with me. So thank you for coming along today. Um, 
so let's make a start. I wanted you to just take a second just to think. I'm not going to make anyone share anything and I appreciate the chat's disabled, so um, that makes it very difficult as well. But um, just think about the ways in which you engage in practice education. So often as um, when people say what you're doing to support students, there's kind of an expectation that the next words are going to be around. I'm a practice educator, um, but there's loads of different ways that we can get involved in supporting practice based learning, supporting placement, supporting practice education, whatever words you want to use. It's all for the same thing. And what I want to do today really is have a chance to think about the ways in which we can do that, but also taking the lens of thinking about it for your own personal CPD so that you can be thinking about how you can use this to support your own career as well and your own personal and professional development. So here's some different ways in which we um, might be able to support placements. You might be doing some of these now. You might be thinking about doing it or have heard um, as Elma and Claire have been talking about different ways of getting involved. So there's um, taking part as part of a team member, thinking about being a long arm supervisor. It might be that you mentor new educators um, and, and helping them settle into that role. Um, taking project work, so it might be that you can lead on supporting an aspect of project work that students and apprentices can get involved in. Um, you might lead a specialism workshop. Um, so an area you know, taking time to spend some with students when each time different students come talking through a particular area of practice. You could do it in a hybrid, hybrid way or a blended way. Um, and you might think about peer assisted learning. And you could talk here, with, I've put here around taking a, a two to one model. Claire's talked about a five to one there. Um, we know that there's different models up to a 10 to one that I've heard about, um, and also a one to one model. I know that at the moment there's quite a lot of conversation about using one to one models, and certainly, you know, the placement demand is out there for people to be. Um, working and taking more than one student at a time but also more importantly the research is out there to show the benefits to the learners but also to yourself of taking more than one student at a time however to contradict myself and um, if you're not taking students and this is the way for you to get involved a one-to-one -one model is absolutely fine too you know it's a really good starting point if you're championing taking students within your your placement environment your work environment then that's great we want everyone to get involved in a way that works really well for them so that you can give our learners the best you know, best opportunity and the best introduction to the fabulous profession of occupational therapy. Um, so they're going to want to continue their time within the, within the profession and that you are able to continue to support learners in a way that works for you as well. So um, just to kind of go slightly off track, but I'll bring us back in a minute. Recently been working with CSP and we've launched a series of seven um, principles of practice based learning. So this is recognising that we all need to be getting involved in practice based learning. Um, and these aren't rocket science. There's nothing on here that's particularly complicated. Uh, work with Colleen on these and Tamsin Baird at um, CSP. Um, and these are seven different principles to help support the embedding of practice based learning. And I'm sharing them with you because there's what I'm talking about in a minute is kind of relevant to two of these particularly. Oh, I whizzed through that one, so I'll just go back. So principle two is talking about placements taking place across all areas, pillars and levels of practice. So this kind of goes back to saying, what role do you take? It doesn't matter, you know, um, where you're working, there is a role for everybody within practice based learning. It might be that you need to think about it a little differently to how you've thought about it in previous roles, but you guarantee you there's a role for you within supporting our students and our next generation of OTs. So that's recognising that um, where we're working and how we're working, how we're practising is changing and the breadth of career opportunities is, is huge and really inspiring. Who'd have thought we'd be talking about paddle boarding a year ago? Let me know that it's all moving at a pace. Principle four talks about using flexible, appropriate and supportive models of supervision and delivery. So this is about thinking about the ways in which we can get involved and provide that supervision to our learners. Claire's just talking about, uh, Claire's just said about not talking about traditional and non-traditional placements. I'm absolutely with her. Our principles say here, there is no such thing as a, tra a traditional placement. However, we're also struggling for a little bit of language um, to help us clarify that. So we do still talk about traditional and non-traditional placements all of them equally valuable, a huge equal learning opportunities for our students. Um, if you could think of better language, then please help me because that's I'm on a bit of a mission to try and work through that so that we can take away this traditional, non-traditional um, conversation. 
but we need to think flexibly in how we supervise learners um, and how we're delivering placements, recognising that we're working in a, a different world, a modern practice, and that those placement opportunities, you know, if we think about how people are working together, that gives those students an opportunity to be chatting together and learning. If we're working as part of a team, it gives us an opportunity to get together and really think about our learning as well and how we can ensure that we're delivering the best placement that also helps us and supports our professional development. So if I just, um, oh, there's one more, yeah. So practice-based learning is designed with a whole team approach. So again, that's recognizing that everybody has a role. People who are in practice, people who, um, sorry, everyone in practice, people who are in maybe leadership roles and maybe don't have a clinical caseload in the same way, um, people who are registered and non-registered practitioners, we've all got a role for supporting practice-based learning. And so it's about finding that opportunity that works for you, as I've said. So what we want to think about now is how supporting practice-based learning uh, will then support your own professional development, your own continuing professional development. And so I want you to just take a few minutes to think about this and how it might do that for you. There's an exam some examples here. I've stopped with the list purely because I've run out of space on the, on the slide. So, um, you know, it might help you in terms of developing your leadership skills. It might help you in terms of time management. Um, might give you some opportunities to manage difficult conversations. And this isn't necessarily, you know, having a student that might be finding placement difficult. This might be about giving feedback can be really difficult for some people, thinking about how we can help people to develop in different ways um, and move conversations forward. Using that supervision experience um, might be an, a new opportunity that you don't have with other aspects of your role. Lots of opportunities for reflection, both with people, uh, with the learners themselves, with your colleagues and individually. It gives you an opportunity to link up with the education providers, and that might be something that you're thinking about doing if you're thinking about different career pathways, as well as just enhancing those links and everybody working together. Opportunities to think about theory into practice, which we're all doing anyway, but our learners will be coming out with different different bits of theory, maybe new, new models, new, new um, evidence, um, different research articles, all sorts of different bits. Um, it gives you a chance to have those conversations, discussions and debates. Hopefully it will give you some increased confidence in your field, gives you a chance to meet up with other practice educators and people taking other roles within placements and that team working and cross team working as well and cross profession working often. So have a think about how placements and your role within placements might support your own personal and professional development. And I wanted to help us do that by thinking about this through an occupational therapy perspective. So you're probably familiar with these three words if you're from an OT background. And I want us to think about it from a person, environment and occupation perspective and that model there. So if we talk through each of these. So if we think about you as a person, have a think about what your personal strengths are and what your professional strengths are and then what your areas for development are or your areas that you want you've never tried before and um, something you've no idea you know how, how good you are if you want a better word at them um, areas that you know that you want to work on and improve and develop and think about how practice-based learning might provide opportunities to support those areas for you And then if you think about the environment, so think about this environment as the place in which you're working um, and the environment, therefore, that the, the placement opportunity might be in. So what are the enablers within that work environment to support practice based learning and what potentially are some of the challenges to that? So you're then thinking about um, space, culture, that kind of thing. There's some examples here for you. So it might be around your level of experience. How experienced are you? How confident do you feel taking a learner? Have a go, you know, have a go, see who's around to support you. Um, might be thinking about the culture of the organisation within our professional standards, our ethics. We're talking about um, creating and having a responsibility as individual practitioners in supporting a culture of learning within your organisation. That could be hard if you feel like you're the only person that's trying to do that. Likewise, you might be working in an organisation that's really got a culture of learning and supporting pre-reg learners. And actually, it's now about finding which opportunity works best for you. Um, there's some real practicalities in terms of what technology have you got available for learners and people who are popping in and out of your organisation, what space have you got if people are um, coming into your organisation and it's not a remote um, placement or virtual placement. Sometimes the area of practice that you're within, the client group, can mean that you need to just think carefully about how that might work with um, pre-reg learners. 
your role again might have a different impact in terms of um, whether you feel you know often you know if you're in a clinical role um, and you're working day in day out with different client groups then there's a really clear role for you there is also really clear and, and establishing roles for you within other areas of our practice um, you know thinking about research placements project based placements quality improvement um, thinking about leadership placements so there's loads of different opportunities for you um, and there's also opportunities thinking about what training you might need and um, how do you link in with the university to support that what is there within your organization so all of these things are enablers or potentially barriers, um, and they're all there that we need to just think about whilst we're thinking about how you can get involved in practice-based learning. How are they there? You know, how are they impacting for you in terms of you engaging in practice-based learning? And then the last um, aspect is occupation. So thinking about your role, how can you enable practice-based learning opportunities within that role? And um, I say this all the time, and I don't think you can say it too often. There's often a, a fear for some people that you're in quite a complex role, or you've got a role where maybe you don't see many clients or this or that. Um, learners don't need to do your job. They don't need to come in and do your exact role. They need to be able to meet their learning requirements, the learning outcomes of the placement that they're undertaking. And so there's an opportunity there for you to be thinking about what aspects of your role are something that they could be taking on relevant to their level of study um, and what aspects might not be, might they not need to get involved with. So my background, I used to work in orthopaedics. We had elective, surgery, um, elective client patients and we also had um, trauma. So quite often the first year students, it worked really well for them to work with elective clients. So you see lots and lots of different people with the same condition. And that gave them the opportunity to have that continuity, but recognising and working with people, um, di very different people and understanding them as individuals and how the OT role differed, where there was some constants here and some difference there. And then I could go and do other different bits within my role. Um, and, um, you know, and then they were kind of could manage what they wanted to do and keep their bit nice and contained that worked really well for their learning outcomes. Likewise, it was really busy. I could see one client with them then they could take some time to write up their notes, to think things through, to think about treatment plans, to think about how you write with soap notes and all those different things. And I could keep seeing some other clients. They didn't need to do the volume of work that I did. They didn't necessarily need to do the breadth of work that I did, but it helped them to meet their learning outcomes. So there's lots of ways of us thinking about what we're doing, what our job role is and how it supports our learners. And that often takes a bit of pressure off us as well. So if we think about each of those things individually, hopefully in the middle where we've got our nice overlap here, we're going to be able to find a placement opportunity that is a great experience for everybody. So a positive experience for people, a quality experience and also sustainable. We want to be developing placements that can be repeated because um, it does take a lot of time and effort supporting our learners. So we want to do this in a way that's sensible to help you do something that you can repeat and repeat and repeat. So I've got a couple of examples here of, um, they're not real case studies, uh, but they are based on lots of different conversations that we've had with people and, and pulling those together. So this is an example here of Joe, who's an experienced educator and recently taken on the servi a service manager role. So this is a new role for him. Um, and within that role, he's um, develop obviously developing his leadership roles. He doesn't have a clinical caseload. So um, was missing his students um, and seeing his students, which was something that was a big part of his life, his, his life, his work life, um, always took students. So there's an opportunity here to think about um, having a leadership placement. So Joe was able to identify a quality improvement project, which he was able to work on. And the students could be with him three days a week and two days in a clinical area of practice relevant to that project. So that's a really nice way of maintaining links from a clinical point of view, um, having a shared placement so you could have a couple of students at a time um, and yet they can be topping and tailing or doing the project on the same day and the clinical work on the same day together. And they've got that opportunity within there with amongst themselves to have that peer support. Um, but also Joe is in a, a non-clinical role and able to continue to support learners uh, while still settling into his role. Um, and that supports him in developing his own leadership skills as well. A second example here is for Alicia. So um, Alicia works um, in a, as a lone occupational therapist for a charity, um, hasn't had lots of experience of taking students herself. And the nature of the charity work means that there's a lot of cross-service working, taking referrals from a local community um, service. 
So saw an opportunity here to take students um, in terms of thinking about how they could raise the profile of occupational therapy within their own setting as the only as the lone OT having students around is great because it can broaden the amount of work and the breadth of work that they're getting involved in um, and also support her you know, having that other other peers um, from the occupational therapy world with them but also created that links to have a split placement so that it could also be within an NHS setting um, and a community setting there so that they are then able to see that link between community and charity and it helps to go and build that bridge for the for the learners but the other bit i forgot to say here is this one someone who's part-time for this case scenario so in having um, there's often a, a bit of a conversation around i work part-time i'm not sure that i can take learners absolutely you can um, and we know that with a lot of different models where students are working um, and having a long arm supervision um, experience but also we know that for some people they you know as the educator you can find that quite challenging if you're part-time and wanting to make sure that that student, those students are supported so through doing this way and having other people involved we've always got safe points of contact for our students to make sure that they've got people who can support them through their learning so this is thinking here about somebody who's wanting to show the value within their own practice of occupational therapy and using us as our learners to provide that opportunity to think about the breadth of working but also making it work for them and what they're wanting to develop within their own practice. And then the last scenario here, whoop, just gone to sleep a minute. Oh, hang on, let me go back one more. <laughs> um, oh, I've lost somebody. I've lost, I've lost Neve. Okay, so Neve was the other person. Um, let me just go back. I think I've just jumped a little bit quick there. So Neve was the other person who was just before Joe. Here we go. Oh no, for some reason that slide's completely disappeared. I'll tell you about Neve. So Neve is a recently registered occupational therapist. Um, so working at a band five, if we were thinking about an NHS setting. Um, and so is wanting to get involved in thinking about um, moving up into a band six role. So using practice-based learning as an opportunity to think about what skills she could need to do, might need to develop and would support her CV for that role. So thinking about supervision and taking on a supervisory role within um, being a practice educator was a great opportunity for her to really strengthen her CV. And she was able to link up with somebody who's a really experienced educator, but recently moved into a different role. And whilst they're settling into that role, they're not taking students at the moment. And so was able to be mentored by um, this person. So Neve was able to be mentored to support her in settling into that role. And that meant that everybody could continue um, to support learners, but also it does give Neve that opportunity to think about supervision and some of the other things we've talked about there in terms of um, managing difficult conversations, thinking about supporting people, discussing, thinking about reflection and that kind of thing. So there's three scenarios there to think about. And I'm, you know, I'm sure as aspects that are relevant for, for different people. So let me just get back to the last slide. So I want to just have a think about um, the ways in which you are engaging in practice-based learning and how it can support your CPD and just take that time to think about currently doing this with you know in terms of thinking about students and apprentices how does it support your professional development but also begin to think about what professional development needs you've got and what other opportunities are there within supporting learners that might support the development of those um, professional development needs and then thinking about what the enablers are and the barriers to that what actions are you going to take and if you like Jamboard, there's a link there um, so that you can post those top tips for other people in terms of thinking about how you're going to take that forward. So doing something different can be quite nerve wracking um, and you've got to be brave, but also it's nice to feel supported whilst you're being brave. And I hope you do feel supported in your organisation, but I know a lot of people are lone workers and your universities, your local unis and the unis that you're linking up with in terms of placements will absolutely support you too. Um, but we also have our COT a placement cafe, which ha is held twice a month. So Mondays um, in the afternoon and Wednesdays is the breakfast one. Um, and so it's an opportunity for you to just drop in and meet other people across the UK and a bit broader, actually, um, who are all wanting to offer the best placement opportunities that they can. So we've had some great conversations there about people wanting to set up new opportunities or people feeling a little bit anxious about, you know, have I got the right skills to do this? How am I going to be able to make sure I give a great opportunity for, for placements um, for our learners? So this is great just to pop along to and have a really supportive chat. Don't need to sign up. Come along anytime. 
um, and drop in within that hour um, and you would be made very very welcome bring a cup of tea and we want to support you um, in your professional development but also support you in supporting our learners as well for those of you who are doing a or, or undertaking a non-traditional placement and i'll just put that proviso in with the language there and um, so you know the placements that we talked about in terms of a leadership placement role emerging placement research placement that kind of thing and um, we offer our rcot a practice-based learning program which is essentially virtual online placement visits with um members of the RCOT's team. So that includes Steve Ford, who's our chief exec, who can have a conversation about thinking about change, thinking about leadership, all sorts of things related to his role. Um, our directors and professional advisors and um, Nikki and her team who lead on professional development. So there's lots of opportunities there for you, but um, for your student to come along, but also for you as practice educators. And it's great if you want to both come along and you can have those conversations together and then also take them back into the workplace. Those sessions are designed to be, and um, we pretend to have a couple of slides to offer a catalyst for a conversation, but we expect our learners to be facilitating that conversation and leading that conversation and bringing in questions. So again, that's something that you can then think about relevant to your own placement setting um, and as a support mechanism for you there. So I think that's everything I wanted to cover really. Um, the key bit for me is we need to make placements work for you as well as they do for our learners. They're so important, um, you know, and giving people the best introduction to the profession that comes from you enjoying that role as a practice educator and really seeing the value for you. And I can guarantee you it would be hugely valuable for your learners. These are my contact details and I'm on Twitter as well. Um, so do contact me. I'm terrible at ignoring uh, messages on Twitter. I don't see them, but I do do email me and I will get in touch. And um, thank you for your time today. Hi, thanks for that, Carolyn. So we'll go through some questions. If you'd just like to put your questions in the chat. So we have two questions so far. So the first one, we've got three now. So uh, I think the first one will be from for Alma. It says, did this increase placements within the service in terms of, I think, your portfolio that you're talking about? It did include or increase placement offers from staff that wouldn't normally have taken students. The way that um, we organise our allocations, each of the five trusts has a set allocation or a commitment to provide so many students. Um, and then the trust um, has their allocation. It's um, 56 students we provide throughout the five placements in the year. And um, that hasn't changed. Now, there are discussions next week as to whether that's going to change or not, because they're trying to increase the number of students coming in each year. Um, but so I have more options for offers now. Um, while my numbers are still the same, um, there um, I do have more offers so that I can we work on a rolling basis. So I have the placements. I know where the next students are going from now until June. Um, so I do have more offers and it can share out the load that bit easier. OK, thanks for that. And the next question, it says, can you see the barriers benefits to using these approaches for newly qualified staff, long arm supervision, team approach and peer support elements? So I think this might be both for um, I think Claire would be um, mm -hmm. the team approach. So uh, sorry, long arm supervision. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I would always advocate that newly qualified therapists use a buddy system. So they link in with a more experienced practice educator. I don't think there's any reason why newly qualified therapists couldn't offer a placement like that. And if we actually reflect on back on what I was saying is a lot of the um, NQTs have actually experienced different placements who are actually best placed to then support their learners on them. So yeah, a buddy system and some are often best placed to, to deliver these. Okay. And do you have anything to add, um, Alma, about the team approach or any peer support elements? Um, yeah, I definitely think the newly qualified staff, while some of them are in areas on their own, if they can have a buddy system. Um, I also organise a band five governance group so that all our band fives um, meet together virtually once a month or once every six weeks. Um, for support and to look at project work and um, sometimes there's a presentation 
Um, sometimes it's just half an hour where they can support each other and discuss particular issues. So okay. that gives a bit more support as well. Okay. Carolyn, do you have anything to add? I, I think just to say that it's about finding the role that works for you and your skills. So I think it's not about necessarily saying at this grade, at this band, this is the role you will have. Everyone has skills and expertise and we're all getting in, involved in different things and it's working to your strengths. I think for me, it's really key that everyone has a role in practice based learning. The, pretty much the second that you're registered you know it becomes part of your workload um, and that's something that we all have a commitment to doing and that might change in terms of the role you take so it might be that you are um, supporting somebody else who's taking the lead in supervision and you're kind of almost shadowing it or being a, an additional support there or it might be that you are a long arm supervisor and um, they all require different skills and I think you know our, our learners who are now becoming our um, registered occupational therapists and into that preceptorship and early careers are coming with a huge range of different skills we have a lot of mature learners who are coming with different professional backgrounds and different experiences um, and work experiences and they're bringing those skills into their OT practice so it's really about understanding as an individual and as a manager understanding your team in terms of harnessing their skills and supporting them and finding the best way for them to be um, a practice educator or get involved and define that role um, and keep redefining that role as you're going through your career and it's going through its own pathway of um, different opportunities different spaces and thinking time that you've got to get involved okay thanks for that there was just a comment in there is asking about the presentation and links so these webinars will be uploaded on the rcat website we haven't got a time date yet but they will be on there soon and also there's another question saying um any specific las training provided i'm assuming is that london ambulance service maybe or long arm supervision i think oh long arm supervision <laughs> so many acronyms so many acronyms yeah, LAS, sorry yeah any specific sorry las training provided is there any um i think claire or carolyn well it not from rcot but link up with your local university who absolutely will want to support um, the best quality placements that they can so they will offer different types of um, preparation for placement and different roles and there's also you know lots going on within different organizations as well but i think if you're uni if you're not sure what's happening within your organization or you work for a, yourself um, or a small organization then i would go to your university who will be able to point you in the right direction and probably offer you the right support as well yeah can I add add to that as well? Actually, is that although the sort of the mode of delivery is different, you're still delivering supervision to the students. So that is transferable skills that we all have. Um, and I think a lot of people can get hung up on that as long arm. How do I do that? How do I do that? It, it's just a different way to deliver the same type of supervision. Um, certainly, that's how I thought about it, and that's because I didn't get any specific training, but hopefully managed to do it. Well, I did manage to do it. <laughs> And your long arm supervision was all virtual, was it? Um, a couple of them were hybrid, um, just to support people. But yeah, if um, we've had another couple that we've supported that have been completely virtual, and have worked really well as well, and the feedback's been really positive. Okay, that's fine. So there isn't any more questions in the chat. Do any of you have any comments? No. That's fine. Well, thank you very much. It's very, very insightful. Oh, there's actually one more that just came through. Sorry. In MDT and expanding REP beyond OT nursing, have concerns signing of learning um, learning while being remote? Have any of them raised any learning while any concern signing of learning? Maybe any issues, maybe? Of it's learning about while signing off competencies and things like that that happens within nursing. I think, yeah, potentially, yeah. yeah. I think this is a you know it's a big change of practice for people isn't it moving online and um that requires the same skills to be used differently and some new skills as well and i think where we might have um thanks and so you could just confirm there um you know i think where we are working differently we are needing to you know in some ways it's almost like that long arm supervision that we're not seeing everything but it's about how we ask the questions and how we're chatting to our learners you know and asking the, the right questions in terms of seeing that development of their learning and also just think you know you can see someone's learning by the way in which they're approaching something and watching that step up and that breadth grow as well and also the step up in their learning so i can see claire nodding because that's what she's having to do all the time okay. so often it might feel like long arm supervision i guess in, in terms of that model which supports what claire's saying about it's same skills in a different way under a different title 
Yeah, and I think in long arm you also have, don't forget, they're with an uh, organisation. So you have someone in that organisation that you can have a conversation with to say, how is that learner doing? Are mm -hmm. they managing to have a conversation with you? If they can manage to have a conversation with users of a third sector, they can manage to have a conversation in an acute hospital. They can manage to have a conversation in other places. Um, and I, I use the analogy of like, we're always telling our um, school pupils they need to catch up at the moment because of post-COVID. And if we're telling our learners and students the same thing, is it time to change our expectations a little bit? And the learners that are coming out are very different learners to what I came out as. And I think it's adapting that and accepting that they are continual learners. And I love what Elma said, I actually wrote it down, that um, all experts were once beginners. Um, mm -hmm. And I think, you know, holding on to that and building on that is a really good, valuable sort of thought to have. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks for your time. So the presentation has really demonstrated that practice-based learning does contribute to student learning and also provides a CPD opportunity for the whole team. And I think Alma spoke about team-based placements mm -hmm. and the team is involved in practice-based learning. So it's not just one person. So recognize that everyone has a role regardless of your grade, working hours, involving support staff, just utilizing various roles within the team, providing support for practice educators, developing and updating knowledge and skills for staff. So there's an opportunity for all. And just really you be utilizing long arm supervision approaches, especially in non-traditional placements, or obviously we need to look at the language around that. So, you know, and obviously have a read of the practice, the principles of practice-based learning and just have a think about how you can use this within your team and in practice, obviously, and across education as well. So just thinking differently about practice-based learning, like different approaches, what can what can we do within our in our teams? How can we support our learners? And just increasing placement capacity as well for our future workforce. So I think that's really important that we kind of start to think differently and just you know utilizing all the things the services and support and things that we have existing already not just setting up it might be okay people talk about maybe um practice-based learning innovation and, and new new placements but then you can also look at your existing service and see what you can actually do within your service as well and how we can increase that really so um but it's really so there's a link here so there's a five minute reflection tool on the rcot website so it might be useful for you to look, have a look and download that and see if it can you can use it as your reflection it might help you consolidate all of your information that you've gathered today as well and if the feedback if you can just scan this qr code and just give us some feedback on the session and it'll also help us um planning the next webinars and obviously future training and future resources as well. So it's all, there's a link there, but if you just scan the QR code and yep, and this is the website for the practice-based learning site and these webinars will eventually be hosted on there as well. So there's some other resources on there, the reflective scenarios, information about the placement cafe that uh, Carolyn mentioned and also the placement program. Okay, so well, thank you for your time and your thoughts. So if you do want to talk on social media, it's hashtag RCOTPBL, and this is the website that all the information will be hosted on. Okay, and there's the references. Well, thank you very much for your time. Good evening.